we need to talk. Do you know what the Republican action plan really is? Well, you don't have to guess because they wrote it all down in a 900-page report from the Heritage Foundation called Project 2025. Two things. One, it's time to really start paying attention. And two, it's really important to take them at their word. UNFTR. It's Super Bowl 2016. A few of us got together who all had kids around the same age at a friend's house to watch the favored Carolina Panthers take on the aging Peyton Manning of the Broncos. And my buddy who was hosting the party invited one of his childhood friends named Anthony who wound up stealing the show. First of all, his family came first and then he arrived like a half hour later because he just wanted to bike there. Not like a motorbike, like a bicycle. And they don't live anywhere close to my friend's house. Anyway, his running commentary was so enthusiastic and like childlike and he was so prone to like outbursts and he would like run around and just put his kids in a headlock. He'd wrestle people on the front lawn and he just started yelling out this one particular phrase every time the Broncos had the ball and it became part of our lexicon from that day forward. He would scream out, Manning with time! So whenever Manning hung in the pocket for more than a second, he'd scream out, Manning with time! Right? If he said it once, he said it a thousand times with zero self-awareness and we were all dying behind him. Now, I know this is a random way to start here, but stay with me. It's one of those core memories that kept coming back to me when I was going through the Heritage Foundation 2025 plan. Republicans with time. Republicans with time on their hands is a very dangerous thing. And only Anthony's words from 2016 kept me from tearing my hair out as I reviewed this conservative action plan. Now, we've covered the rise of the conservative think tank in America and the negative consequences that they've had on the social and economic fabric of the country. But it deserves a quick review. Here's how it goes. Billionaires and their minions come up with ideas and plans to hoard wealth and consolidate power. They fund think tanks to develop white papers that provide a policy rationale to implement these changes. Then they pass this information to billionaire-funded nonprofit advocacy groups to craft model legislation for Republican legislators in Congress and state legislatures. Corporately controlled conservative media gins up controversy to manufacture consent in the court of public opinion, and the legislators appear on conservative programs to talk about their model legislation that they're proposing because it's backed by solid research from the think tanks. The bill's passed, and then they're challenged in court, only to lose the challenges because the billionaire-backed Federalist Society has stacked the district courts, the appellate divisions, and now the Supreme Court with conservative activist judges. And that's how you carry out a long and bloodless coup. The world heavyweight champion of think tanks is the Heritage Foundation, which is also the bete noir of this program. In so many ways, Heritage has paved the way for the current state of affairs. Bloated military budgets and endless war, tax cuts for the wealthy, gutting social services, criminalizing reproductive health, kids in cages, anti-transgender legislation, rampant deregulation, union busting, just some of the knockouts from the heavyweight champ. Republicans with time. The Heritage Foundation was founded in the early 1970s with money from the Coors family, which had a long history of funding conservative causes. And it was a slow burn at first, but then suddenly, Republicans unexpectedly found themselves with time on their hands when a relatively unknown governor from Plains, Georgia named Jimmy Carter beat the accidental president, Gerald Ford. Again, it's territory that we've covered before. Think of all the conservative powerhouse inventions that arose in such a short period of time. The whole thing kicks off with the Powell Memo in 1971. George Mason University splits from UVA in 72. The Heritage Foundation was founded in 73. Cato Institute in 77 with Koch Brothers money. The Chicago School Economic Policies take center stage amidst stagflation. James Buchanan and Michael Horowitz begin shaping a conservative agenda to take over the courts in the late 70s, leading to the creation of the Federalist Society in 82. This was the neoliberal intellectual framework determined to turn back social and economic progress for the masses. The Heritage Foundation kicked everything into high gear, though, during the Clinton years and was locked and loaded upon the election of Ronald Reagan with a stream of policy proposals and research that ultimately shaped the governing platform of both Reagan terms. Fellows and staff members of Heritage were drafted into the administration, such as Edwin Meese, who served as Reagan's attorney general. 
heritage policy recommendations from tax cuts and welfare reform to rampant deregulation and aggressive militarization were all pursued, promoted, and enacted. More than 60% of the foundation's proposals made it into actual policy under Reagan. And that's what happens when Republicans have time. Republicans were still in a hot streak after Reagan when his VP, George H.W. Bush, was elected. There was a sense that Republicans might never lose the presidency again. The Gulf War was enormously popular with the American people, and Bush's continuation of Reagan-era policies were as well. Until they weren't. After a dozen years, the Republicans once again suddenly found themselves on the sidelines with time. Midway through the first Clinton term, the Republican Party released the much-ballyhooed Contract with America, a reassertion of principles and policy prescriptions for the Republican Party. More tax cuts, work requirements and time limits for welfare, tough penalties for criminals, tort reform, term limits, more deregulation, more money for the military, and a balanced budget reform. Surprisingly, the Republicans were outdone on most of these items by the Clinton administration, just not in the way that one might hope. A few of the agenda items have yet to be enacted, such as the balanced budget amendment and term limits, but most of the policies wound up making it through the legislature and were signed into law by President Clinton. Clinton's answer to these devastating neoliberal reforms was to steal Republicans' thunder and propose them himself. After the Clinton era, it was time for another Bush era, this one twice as long as the first, and hand-delivered by the Supreme Court. But not before another initiative was birthed by a conservative think tank in the waning days of Clinton's second term. The Project for a New American Century was an organization comprised of Nixon and Reagan flunkies like Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Bill Kristol, and Paul Wolfowitz, all of whom would assume roles in W's administration. PNAC, as it's known, became fodder for conspiracy theorists for two reasons. The first is that one of its central foreign policy initiatives in a document titled Rebuilding America's Defenses from September of 2000 was to pursue regime change in Iraq. The second is that it plainly stated that, well, let me just read from the report to see if you can spot the moment that still fuels conspiracy theories to this day. You ready? To preserve American military preeminence in the coming decades, the Department of Defense must move more aggressively to experiment with new technologies and operational concepts, and seek to exploit the emerging revolution in military affairs. The effects of this military transformation will have profound implications for how wars are fought, what kinds of weapons will dominate the battlefield, and, inevitably, which nations enjoy military preeminence. The process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, end quote. Yeah, that last part didn't age well in conspiracy circles. But here's the point of it all. The Pearl Harbor-like catalyzing event would indeed come one year later on 9-11, and the PNAC blueprint would be adopted and enacted almost overnight. The ultimate Republicans with time scenario. Iraq never stood a chance. Now, I don't think I need to rehash what happened the last time Republicans found themselves out of office, but here's a quick overview. Black Democrat gets top job. The Tea Party is formed in response. Ayn Rand sycophants are elected to Congress to block any and all movement after the first midterm bloodbath, except for droning innocent civilians into the Stone Age in foreign countries, bailing out Wall Street and giving bankers a pass on the financial crisis. But I digress. They had time to get their shit together until a fly flew into the ointment. The shit hit the fan. A car went off the rails. We hit a brick wall. Oh yes, the Republicans had time and the Republicans had plans. And then this fucking guy says Obama wasn't born here. Uh, the birth certificate. So Obama insults him on national television. Donald Trump. Then this guy comes down an escalator and he says. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. And then he won. And then a lot of really bad shit happened. Withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords ultra-conservative Supreme Court nominations, upending of diplomatic norms, tariffs that actually hurt U.S. job growth and GDP, 
the bungled response to the pandemic resulting in hundreds of thousands of needless deaths, more tax cuts for the wealthy, federal agencies gutted, billionaires cheating the tax code with impunity, controversial pardons, the demonization of the LGBTQ community, hindering investigations, trying to subvert the election, and inciting an insurrection, giving important roles to family members, stealing campaign funds to pay for his legal defense in multiple cases, being impeached twice. He's also a rapist, serial sexual abuser, and a pathological liar. And he's the Republican nominee for president, again, by like a landslide. Now look, we've done a lot of soul searching and hand wringing over this rematch, and I don't believe Biden is fit to remain in office. His legislative accomplishments in the first year were impressive by historical standards, but he fucked progressives on key issues like minimum wage and student debt relief, and didn't go far enough on climate resilience, Medicaid expansion, immigration reform, and poverty alleviation. And now he's turning hard against immigration reform by backing punitive measures at the border and facilitating the ongoing slaughter of Palestinians in Gaza. And despite performative support of unions and even some important measures that protect the right to organize, he failed to bring the corporate class to heel during the inflation crisis, which gave cover to the Federal Reserve to jack up interest rates and crush households all across the country. Biden's bottom-up, middle-out strategy can work, but it needs way more time than it likely has. As a result, people feel less well-off than they did under Trump. And that's not good. Biden has lost key support among Arab and Muslim voters that have a demonstrable impact in key states like Michigan. Also not good. He took way too long to address the border crisis, and when he finally did, he adopted the Republican stance just like Clinton did in the 90s. If you're not going to differentiate yourself from the opposition on such a critical issue, then what's the fucking point? The hell of this whole thing is that as bad as Biden has been for Palestine, there's no question that Trump would be worse. As bad as Biden's been on the border, there's no question Trump would be worse. And as bad as Biden has been for the working poor and the impoverished, Trump would be worse. But it doesn't end there. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the Republican Party's word for it. When Trump won the first time, even Republicans were surprised. That's why it took them a while to get their ducks in a row. If you recall, Trump's only real legislative accomplishment before he lost power in the midterms was the enormous tax cut for the wealthy. Everything else was pretty much done by executive order and by the seat of his pants. This time around, we've got Republicans with time, and they have a plan. Moms for Liberty, Turning Points USA, Tea Party Patriots, National Right to Work Foundation, Liberty University, Hillsdale College, ALEC, more than 80 organizations have co-signed the new Heritage Foundation plan titled Project 2025, the Presidential Transition Project. And it's a fucking doozy. Now, on the podcast, we read out the highlights from the report verbatim, so if you want to hear the whole thing fleshed out, check it out. A link to the pod is on unftr.com. For our purposes, I'm going to summarize the points that we covered in the podcast and editorialize a bit for expediency's sake. So basically, I read the 900-page report so you don't have to. And a lot of what you're going to hear can be done by executive order. Now, a lot of it can't, but the nightmare scenario, of course, is that Trump takes control with both houses of Congress as well and is way more prepared to enact several of the measures that you're about to hear. So let's get after it. The report starts by taking aim obviously, at woke culture, deleting all DEI terms and initiatives from any legislation and federal rule that exists, ending all gender reassignment therapy, national abortion ban if possible, and at a minimum, deploying federal powers to force states to comply with statutory bans, make federal worker wages and benefits comparable to private sector wages. Basically, they're creating their own litmus test for compensation, which allows them to benchmark federal employee wages and benefits against private sector employment tiers of their own choosing. Translation, suppress federal wages in lockstep with lower wage private sector jobs. Privatize federal benefit plans. Eliminate public sector unions. Expand our nuclear arsenal and prioritize China as the unequivocal national security threat. End informal congressional notification when we engage in foreign military action. And basically, this is a way to subvert congressional oversight or even just informing them of military actions abroad. It's a pretty wide exception for an executive authority that already has preposterous overreach. Speaking of overreach, they also want to administer armed service aptitude tests to all students in schools that receive federal funding. That's basically all public schools and even charter schools. 
Expel those with gender dysphoria for military service. Privatize the TSA. Get rid of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program and eliminate unions in the Department of Homeland Security. Remember when the Border Patrol was caught whipping migrants and rounding them up on horseback? They want to bring that back. They also want to increase detention space to 100,000 beds and repeal all temporary protected status designations. All right, so let's switch over to foreign policy recommendations. They start off with Iran. Now, they acknowledge that only the Iranian people can overthrow the government of Iran. But they make it clear that we're here to help in any way possible. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Stop the spread of communism from Venezuela because apparently it's still 1953. Now, this next one is the definition of bait and switch. And I'm just going to read it directly. Okay. <laughs> Regardless of viewpoints, all sides agree that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is unjust and that the Ukrainian people have a right to defend their homeland. The next conservative president has a generational opportunity to bring resolution to the foreign policy tensions within the movement and chart a new path forward that recognizes communist China as the defining threat to U.S. interests in the 21st century. Hmm. So essentially, Russia is so terrible that we should go to war with China. It's like Bush invading Iraq after a bunch of guys from Saudi Arabia got together in Afghanistan to bomb the U.S. It just always makes sense in Republicanville. Anyway, speaking of interventions, the plan speaks to the, quote, opportunity to spread democracy, as one does, but very specifically to Venezuela, Colombia, Guyana, and Ecuador. And because certain countries in Africa have precious minerals and ports that we need, we might want to spread some democracy there as well. Oh, and since international organizations kind of frown on the way that we spread democracy by overthrowing nations and privatizing their national industries, we should basically just put all international organizations out of business. Should the president find it necessary to assassinate someone, anyone, the executive must employ, quote, creative thinking on how to increase covert action. Now, over on the domestic front, we can't have commies like Big Bird and gay couples like Bert and Ernie permeating the minds of our children. So we're going to defund the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and take away the tax-exempt status of all PBS and NPR stations. But we're going to leave the tax-exempt status in place for churches. Get rid of all climate change policies. Dismantle DEI requirements and objectives from within USAID. Implement work requirements for food stamps or SNAP. No summer meals for students unless they take summer classes. And all loan forgiveness programs for student debt shut down the Department of Education and privatize all government student loan programs. Ah, uh, horseshit! Now I'm not done. Let's talk taxes. They want a simple two-rate individual tax system of 15% and 30%. 30% for anyone at the Social Security wage base and above, 15% for anyone below. Oh, and 18% for corporations. Okay, this one I have to contextualize a bit. Right now, 40% of households don't pay any income tax because they don't make enough money to qualify to pay taxes. Also, there's no mention of K-1 income or carried interest provisions, for example, because the wealthiest people in this country, they're not paid like the rest of us. They can pay taxes like corporations. So, poor people who haven't had to pay any federal income tax would theoretically have to pay 15% while the wealthiest people in this country would have to pay 18%. And for those who make more than around $150,000, that's what they mean by the Social Security wage base, they would be paying 30%. And it doesn't touch carried interest income provisions that allow wealthy investors to hide money from the IRS, and it doesn't reclassify stock options as income either. It's just bullshit. And they're coming for savings as well. Dig this, they want to allow all taxpayers to save up to $15,000 a year of post-tax earnings in savings account that look like Roth IRAs. So after tax, right? It's in an account that allows people to purchase investments and gains on these funds would be non-taxable. This provision acts like your friend, but it's a Trojan horse. It's basically the Peter Thiel loophole. It's essentially encouraging people to invest in closely held businesses or things like IPOs that have the ability to grow exponentially and then be withdrawn without penalty. It's a tax shelter. It's a shelter that avoids capital gains, but it would be sold to the public as a personal responsibility investment that provides cover for their real purpose, which is to phase out the Social Security Trust. 
Now, they also want to reduce the estate tax to 20% and increase the exemption amount to $13 million permanently. This is so wealthy people can pass up to $13 million to their heirs without a dollar being taxed, and then everything above would only be taxed at 20%, which is still 10% less than what they're proposing for the middle class income tax. And don't worry, they're coming after your health care too. The highly touted program to allow Medicare to negotiate certain drug prices, gone. They also want to strengthen asset tests for Medicaid recipients and put time limits on receiving them. So those are just the highlights. Like I said, this document is over 900 pages long and it's co-signed by over 80 conservative organizations with incredible strength, incredible financial wherewithal and lobbying prowess. So here's the difficult conversation that we need to have. If Cornell West makes it onto the ballot in New York, I will vote for him because I'm aligned with his beliefs and I'm appreciative of his consistent activism over the years, not because I think he's a good candidate. In fact, he's a terrible candidate and an even worse politician. Now, New York is going to go solidly Democrat, so I don't have to worry. And it is a way that I can send a message to the establishment that they have to work a lot harder to win us over. I think protesters should continue to disrupt every single Democratic event in support of a free Palestine and continue to call for a ceasefire at a minimum and a permanent halt to the atrocities in the apartheid regime in Israel. We must continue to push our elected officials to invest in poverty elimination, climate change resiliency, Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, a path to citizenship, and so much more. But like I said in the progressive meditation episode, we lost the presidential election a long time ago when our candidates were sidelined by a corrupt DNC, when none of our issues made it to the Democratic platform and the officials that we hoped would tie up the Democratic majority in Biden's first two years were soundly defeated and silenced. This election is not the time to stage an electoral protest because we don't have to wonder what a second Trump regime would look like. Those of us with power and a voice have an obligation to protect the least among us right now as we work in the background to reorganize and gather our strength. Because this Project 2025, this agenda, this is evil stuff. This is inverted totalitarianism. This is dystopian corporate consolidation bullshit. And what's different this time around is that they own the court. So if we hand the keys to the Oval Office back to Trump, and take the risk that Republicans control both houses, they won't flounder like they did in 2016 because of one key difference. Republicans with time. Here endeth the lesson.